uh, event celebrate launch of the transition plan task force. Is it possible? This is. Can you hear a delay? Okay. There's a horrible delay, but never mind. We're here for the transition plan task force, um, setting the gold standard and collaborating internationally. My name's Allegra Stratton. I'm a contributing editor at Bloomberg. I'll quickly introduce the panel, and then we hand over to James Cartledge, who's the Exchequer Secretary to the Treasury, but I remember working with you when I was in the Treasury, James. A lot's happened since then. Uh, first of all, the Vice Chair of GFANS, Mary Shapiro. To your right, we have James Close, who's the Head of Climate at NetWest. Then we have Thomas Lingard, who is the Head of Global Sustainability at Unilever. Mardi McBrien, who is the uh, Head of Sustainability, hold on a second, Strategic Affairs Director, International Financial Reporting Standards Foundation, quite a mouthful, Mardi. And then we have Mark Manning, who's the man from the FCA. So that's your panel. First of all, we'll hear from James, and then we'll open it up. Hello? There is a repeat. Okay, so thank you, Allegra, and everybody. Welcome. Um, you know me, so I am James Cartledge, the Exchequer Secretary to the Treasury, a uh, member of Parliament for South Suffolk. I, I was briefly in the Treasury with, with Allegra. I was Rishi Sunak's PPS when he was. And then if it, I am happy to speak without a microphone if it is really. I think people are struggling to hear in the room. It's the room versus the stream. Justice Minister before that's the only ministerial job I've had and so I've never been on a foreign visit. The most glamorous visits I had was to the Old Bailey or a custody suite in one of our old courts. So very excited. But I'm absolutely delighted to be here and I think the, the key thing is really to stress that, that we're very proud of what was achieved at in Glasgow um, but this is now about implementation and it's really my chance to set out those key reasons why we're doing what we're doing today um, in terms of the mission plans. Um, unfortunately, I will have to leave the end of my speech.
Bye. See you. <laughs> okay. Well, we're losing the Exchequer Secretary, but we have we have an amazing panel. Mary, I'm going to start with you. You're the Vice Chair of GFANS. Talk us through the role that GFANS has played over the last year, supporting the transition plan development. We'll be very lucky if I don't end up on the floor trying to balance on a stool and a microphone and talk at the same time. So, yes, yeah, so um, I'm uh, really pleased to be here. I, um, in addition to being Vice Chair of GFANS, I'm the Secretary of the TCFD, or the Task In addition, there we go. In addition to leading the GFANS Secretariat, I lead the Secretariat on the task force uh, for climate related financial disclosure. So, um, over 550 financial institutions have made net zero commitments. And what GFANS has been all about for the last year is helping operationalize those commitments. How do they go from a mere commitment, which is a good start, but not nearly enough, to actually effectively their commitments, and that's what transition plans are all about. From our perspective, they have multiple audiences. I think the most important is um, those within the company who have responsibility for implementing the commitment, investors and stakeholders. And the transition really sets out four kinds of financings that are appropriate within the context of transition planning. The first is to uh, fund climate solutions. That seems obvious. The second is to fund or finance companies that are already aligned to a one and a half degree pathway. That seems obvious. Perhaps a little less obvious is those companies that have made a commitment to be net zero have robust transition plans and are publicly reporting against those plans that are consistent with a one and a half degree pathway. And the fourth is to finance the phase out of high emitting assets that will never actually be uh, able to be um, aligned with one and a half degrees. So that's what we've been working on um, for this year. We have um, published within the last week our transition plan framework, which is very consistent with the uh, TPT uh, framework, and I'm very honored to serve on the steering committee for the TPT, and um, a number of supplemental materials um, as well to help support the development of transition plans, including uh, work on sectoral pathways, a framework for uh, phasing out high emitting assets, uh, portfolio alignment measurement tools, uh, and um, shortly to come, um, sectoral briefs. Um, for oil, gas, and uh, aviation. So um, all that work is out there now, and I think we focus for the next year on how to help companies, as we did for TCFD after our recommendations were published, how do we help companies actually develop and report against um, uh, credible transition plans. Excellent, Mary. Thank you very much. I think the trick is to speak really closely to the mic. It's still annoying, but I think that's the, that's the way it's the least annoying for everyone. James Close, you're the head of climate at NatWest. Can you explain for people how you think transition plans will be useful for investors and lenders? Uh, thanks, Allegra. Uh, hello, everybody. And uh, thank you. Wonderful. Um, yeah, well, Um, we've set ourselves the target. Five nine percent approval. 
uh, which su surprised even us. We thought it might be more 50-50. But the, the, the key thing is this is going to be the biggest economic transition since the uh, Industrial Revolution. And how can you possibly as a company think about doing that without some kind of dialogue with your investors and other key stakeholders? And transition plans provide a way to put all of the key information about how you are, not just about what you're aiming to do in terms of net zero delivery and emissions reduction plans, but how you're going to do it. What are the levers you're intending to pull um, to get you there? And so we wrote it for investors primarily, uh, and it has deepened the conversations we have with our investor relations teams and, and our investors. But it's also been um, incredibly helpful internally because it, you have to write it effectively in very plain English so that anybody can understand it, even not a climate expert. And, uh, and it means that across our 150,000 employees around the world, there is one document where they go, ah, this is what we're trying to do. This is what we mean by net zero. This is what we don't mean. This is what we think about offsets. This is what we think about not using offsets and so on. And, and it provides a single point of reference to get a whole company moving at speed in a particular direction. Um, we think they're incredibly helpful, both for their in, uh, sort of original purpose of investor engagement, but also as a, uh, an enabling tool internally for driving the transition. Very quickly, I'll hand over to Mark Brian. Your, can you tell us and explain the interaction between the transition plans and the international context? <laughs> Thanks, Allegra, and I must start. And happy birthday, TPT. You share the same birthday as us at the ISSB. I'll never forget to send a card. So first of all, we welcome the work of the TPT to drive real, robust, and credible transition plans from a finance and real economy. It aligns really closely with our global baseline and, and builds off our climate exposure drafts by providing further recommendations on transition plans for the UK and hopefully the global context. We're really pleased to be on the steering group and working very closely with the team in the Secretariat to drive real alignment. And we see the, the, the cooperation and the collaboration between the ISSB and the transition, uh, the TPT Task Force Secretariat as the gold standard globally for how jurisdictions and us should work together to drive real comparability uh, and comparability and get that information to markets that we need. So the ISSB standards are expected to form the future basis in the UK for uh, climate disclosure, building off the TC TCFD. And the TPT builds on the ISSB by providing further recommendations on the transition plans. A and the two sort of uh, extensions fall, I would say, fall into two groups if I had to categorize them. One is where the disclosure information we, we ask for are, are a bit different for the objectives. So the objectives of the TCFD, so for example, around scope three or governance, for example, TPT asked you to go further. And I think the other one that's worth just quickly raising is in our next board meeting, transition plans are very much on the agenda. So I urge, I urge you to read the, read the papers the board have currently on the internet and watch the meetings. They're, av they're publicly available. You can watch the board deliberate on these issues. But rest assured, you know, we are really trying to drive interoperability between these two. So you know, on the board, I, I need too much divergence. Um, and I guess Transition plan. We have a set of three core principles that underpin the transition plan. Ambition, action, and accountability. And these are reflected in the task force of and what I would say is that uh, there, are th there are four main elements. First of all, ambition. Ambition should be set as the way we come to uh, mitigate, manage, and respond to a changing the all about set a very, very clear set of short, medium, and long-term actions that will deliver on that ambition and really force change within the company. Third, <coughs> third is to have really good governance and accountability mechanisms so that the investors Lenders such as uh, James was talking about there can really hold the company to account for the commitment. In work in the middle of next year, we can really take account of all the best feedback. So, 
available. So I really encourage people to get involved in that sandbox. Sorry about the techn technological issues. I actually think you did it the best. <laughs> Sorry, the rest of you. <laughs> I think the answer is the boom. I have a quick follow-up for you, and then I'll try and go up and down before we open it up. What does Vlad look like? A company that decides not to do a transition plan. What happens to them? So James mentioned that within our with, within our um, regular framework, already. And <coughs> we are expecting 2023 that uh, companies will and on a complier explained basis. <coughs> so far, we've seen patchy transition plans. We have seen full uh, articulation of ambition. We haven't seen very, very clear milestones and actions. And we haven't seen that connected to uh, financial statements and financial clarity and simplicity that companies a better job I ask a, a variant of that question to all of you, mostly for simplicity of getting A, across the complexities that you're worried about, and B, avoiding this me. Um, so, Marty, to you, what do you worry about with the implementation uh, once the rules are finalized? And for a company that is turning its face away from transition plans, and I think we all know some off the top of our heads, what would you say to them? Well, we, we set standards, right? Global standards. These global standards, our accounting standards are currently adopted in 154 countries around the world. We have the same ambition and even more, hopefully, into the US for the sustainability standards. This is coming, this is real, and these will all be managed very soon. So my advice is, we still have transition in our standards. You know, we don't go quite as far as the transition, uh, the TPT, but we go a long way. And I think you've just got to get started now, is my advice, or else you'll be, you'll be caught out on the other end. Yep. Um, and so the, the, tension, uh, the tension we've been wrestling with in some of the task force conversations is the gold standard, which is incredibly comprehensive, but at the same time doesn't put companies off, you know, producing one for three years while they work out the answers to all the hard work. The writing our transition plan before there was any guidance. TPT committing to paper what we know already and and taking uh, conversation and a race against time to get people to think about the transition and what they are going to do uh, and uh, yeah as we go into the sandboxing phase and the consultation uh, I think it's something I consultation guidance and feedback on where they think that balance should be. Um, I, I haven't worked for a bank for all that long, but what I've noticed about the way banks operate is they like to be the best at what they do. And I think that uh, as we produce the first uh, uh, tranche of transition plans, uh, everybody will look at who's got the best ones and that will become a means of improving the quality of them. Uh, and I think then, as Thomas says, the quality of the underlying data coming from our uh, counterpart companies will enable us to continually improve the data. And I think what we really do need to make these uh, really high quality is greater standardization and greater commonality around the data. And I think that will really help us uh, drive this whole agenda forward quite rapidly. for some competition.
been in to be a component of how we go forward. Um, we want to get to net zero by all the best intentions and all the best commitments if companies don't have a plan and a roadmap for getting there. And I think regulation is required. Can I ask you, Mary, in the devising of um, working with GFANS over the last year, what's been the most difficult area to overcome? I th look, I think this is complicated work. Um, it's hard for people to get their heads around. Uh, there's a lot going on. Um, I think just sitting down and, and committing to do the work and having access to the data that's necessary to adequately populate a transition plan. We're working on that separately from GFAMS through a partnership between Bloomberg and the French government to develop a data public utility that will make transition-related uh, climate data free of charge, available to everyone in the world, including scopes one, two, and three data, the use of carbon credits, and um, targets um, that uh, companies have set for their greenhouse gas reductions. Having that data will really jumpstart the process of having fulsome transition plans. So I think getting that data piece done, we hope to have a pilot system up and running next summer. Um, but that's, that's a key hurdle for us to overcome. And James, just one to you and then open it up to questions. We're going to have uh, 15 minutes. What's the role of investors in supporting transition plans? Well, I, I think what's going to be really interesting is when we see leaders being get a premium for a multiple on their earnings because they're doing great work on climate. And I think that's when will know that uh, we're not just managing risk, but we're also thinking about uh, the opportunity that sits around the transition. Um, and I think that uh, as we work with investors, we need to kind of get that on their spreadsheet so they're using it to tell uh, what the you know, expected value is of the business. Um, and I think that will uh, be a really big incentive to take the lead in mobilizing finance for uh, for the future and that's what money should be I mean it should project 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 the future of the economy because it's able to discount future cash flows Thomas just the last one can you talk to us about how the transition plans might affect the supply chain and kind of cascade out further into the economy yeah <coughs> so our target is full scope three emission and in the transition plan, we had uh, quite a sort of chunky section on the work our procurement teams are doing to go material by material on what we're buying, both on how, how much uh, emissions there were in each type of material, but also the degree to which our tier one supplier could, could pull that lever. So there are some very easy, well not easy, but there are some things where our, our tier one supplier literally is the one creating the emissions, the chemical processor, and then there are agricultural commodities where it's a much longer value chain, it's much harder to influence. So we've already started to use the transition plan to work out which suppliers we can have direct conversations with about their own transition plans. Uh, and that is, yeah, that's really now driving the prioritization of action. Can all of you to experience the microphone to share the pain? We've got loads of questions, that's fantastic. If you don't mind, I'm gonna sort of start geographically. I think I saw this gentleman here. Hi, hi everybody. I'm from Australia, I've been watching this work very closely. Congratulations on all the effort that's gone into it. Uh, how is it how important is it that we work towards consistency not just within nations but uh, across the world in terms of transition plans and the way that they're communicated into global markets and what are your thoughts about how this works could be leveraged around the world? Mardi, I'm going to ask you to do that first, and then whoever else wants to can jump in. Thank you. I think that's where the international sustainability standards come in. We set that global baseline across the world for transition plans, and the further extension that the TPT have layers on top nicely. So we'll get that consistent, comparable global data set that'll be available for investors and other 
others that want it, and then you can go further. So that's how we'll take this global. But hopefully the work of the TPT and that extension will also you know, embed itself in other jurisdictions around the world as well. If I could just, we want to demonstrate that this is, while developed in the UK, it's going to be um, internationally applicable. And we really hope that we get uh, some really strong engagement from the international community during this sandbox exercise, including um, feeding back practical implementation across jurisdictions so that we can really make sure that the final product can be applied globally. Oh, I, I agree with that completely. And I think um, one of the things we learned from TCF is that global consistency and comparability really value of the disclosure. Um, I'm going to go to this gentleman here, then to the gentleman in the blue shirt, then zigzag. Hello, um, Scott Steedman, BSI, one of the TPT um, workshop uh, participants. Excellent presentation. In the real economy, industry globally is using international standards in the international standards system to deliver medical devices, manufacturing, renewable energy, pharmaceuticals, everything. And we are detecting a lot of frustration through the national standards body with the differences that you've just mentioned there, Mark. And it would be very helpful to know how you expect in FCA, TPT, GFANS, ISSB, FRAG, SEC, how all of these systems plan to use the international standards system to enable the, the, the doing bit of the plan. Beyond the planning is the doing. So how can we link up to the doing? And do you have plans to, to use the standard system to do that? I, I'll, I'll go first, but I'm sure you'll have quite a bit to say on this, Marty. So I think at the end of the day, what we really want to work towards in the entire sustainability reporting space, so not specifically transition planning, but sustainability reporting generally. If we can get to the global baseline that the ISSB is developing, then everything else can flow from that. Then we've got a single point of truth, if you like, that um, standards uh, institutions such as the BSI can take forward and develop the doing piece that flows from those uh, disclosures because we have a common understanding of definitions, methodologies, and um, we have a, a, a common framework that we're working from. So that's, that's the goal, ultimately. Have a global baseline, and then have coalescence around the disclosure framework uh, that we've uh, developed with the Transition Plan Task Force, and that will give all uh, a, a good baseline to follow from. I, I can never really add much when you come after Mark. He does such a good sales job for the ISSB. But I'm, I'm, I would say that all of those standards you've talked about are about helping tell one consistent, comparable, decision-useful information to the market. It, you know, and at the moment, we're getting lots of stories being communicated to the market. So the importance of what's happening now is bringing it all together so there is one story that stacks up. Yeah, so I mean, uh, at the risk of stating the obvious, it's really important to global companies like Unilever that, that, that there is a lot and that we don't have countries running off and doing completely different things. Um, and uh, we've been trying to engage in the TTFD, our CFO is uh, vice chair of that, um, and the TPT now. Um, so we do think it's super important that it's consistent internationally and that all of these different things dock together. And it does look like we're, you know, we're heading in that direction. I'm, I'm an optimist uh, professionally. Uh, a question perhaps for Mark. Um, I work in the insurance industry and there's been a lot of talk here about investors and lenders, but insurance underwriters enable a lot of economic activity, say a Lloyd syndicate underwriting marine insurance burning bunker oil or something. And I was just kind of wondering if you had any perspective on how the insurance system fits into this process that you're engaged in, because I said a lot of the talk's been around investors and lenders. 
Thank you very much. So I, I, I think um, what, we, what we've developed to this point is a disclosure framework that uh, is sector agnostic. And we've got examples in there that, um, that might speak to particular sectors. But there is another work stream underway at the moment that is looking at sector specific guidance. That is being informed by a huge body of work that's been done across sectors already internationally, uh, including from GFANS in the financial sector, where um, there, there, there is uh, <coughs> obvious, obviously a lot of uh, focus on insurers as well as banks and asset managers and asset owners. So I think there is um, guidance there in terms of the disclosing for, um, uh, for, for insurance companies. But of course, insurance companies as users are, are a really important consideration here as well. And they need to understand how the real economy companies that they are underwriting are, um, are, are thinking about the transition and taking actions uh, to uh, ensure that they both contribute to and respond to that transition. Um, one thing that I didn't mention earlier, which I think is probably quite, quite important, is that the approach that we've taken in the disclosure framework is what we call a strategic and rounded approach. And this basically thinks about transition planning uh, beyond a narrow focus on decarbonization, which we think potentially sends the wrong incentives and doesn't necessarily um, do the best job it can in terms of encouraging companies to think about how they can embed and accelerate the transition. So the strategic and rounded approach has three main channels, if you like, by which um, uh, firms can consider their, 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 their ambition and their transition planning. One is their own decarbonization at scopes one, two, and three. Second is to think about the risks and opportunities that they may face as the world around them decarbonizes. And then the third is to look at the various levers at their disposal in their sphere of influence to really think about <coughs> what, what levers they can pull and how they can help embed and accelerate the transition. And as an important... You know, the insurers are big asset owners and they deploy their capital. And there's a really good feedback loop here because if we can get our money to the places that are going to build resilience then the exposure that the insurance businesses are going to have is going to be reduced. So that power of alignment, I think, becomes really, really important. This lady just there. Thank you, um, and thanks to everyone. Congratulations to everyone on, on such a, an immense effort to get this over the line. Um, I'm Bridget Beals, I'm um, the Head of Climate Risk at KPMG. I've just got a question for, for Thomas and James. Um, we've focused a lot today around the disclosure part of this, and. Yep, this all ends in disclosure, but what I'd love to know from the two of you is, you know, how have you mobilized success in your organizations? Is this led through corporate reporting, um, or is this a kind of broader uh, agenda across your organizations? Let's start with Thomas, thank you. <laughs> across your organizations. Let's start with Thomas, thank you. <laughs> I'm, I'm really grateful for that question. I don't know if everybody heard it. It was a question about reporting versus uh, getting on with it, I think. Um, and camp than the report. I was an accountant by training, but not any, I'm not really anymore. And and the transition plan and and that the how-to manual of what we're trying to do. You say in the transition plan in our ARA, but for us this is not driven by reporting. It's driven by the action targets we've set. Um, and, I, and I think obviously they come together through this process, but I, uh, as, a, as a kind of business person, I the transition is first and foremost a company capacity document, a disclosure framework, um, but the, the two dock together. On, on the transition and was leaders in finance who were less interested in the data to more about the narrative, the qualitative aspects of a plan where we talked, about we saw the going down you know, what we knew and didn't know about largely historical, whereas transition plans are all forward-looking. And so they're quite different in terms of the data that you can get around transition plans. You know, you're getting estimates. And a little bit of that in 
disclosures, but no, it's, it's a thinking to that distinction. I think I'll just add to that really that uh, I think it's really important to get leadership on side. So, you know, Alison has been involved in the G fans as chairing Workstream 1.3 for real economy transition plans and also the transition planning task force. And again, another thing that banks are good at is following the uh, corporate strategy in the direction. But I think what we've done that makes me most proud is this, this is driven uh, out of the finance department, but the engagements come from the business. Um, and uh, the level of commitment and activity that went on in the business to understand emissions uh, across each individual sector and then think about sectors and how they connect together in systems has been quite extraordinary really and I, I never thought I'd have a conversation with the guy who's covering the retail uh, business about scope one, scope two and scope three emissions. Uh, but uh, you know that has really started to embed in the organization and it starts to change the way we all think. Okay, we're gonna go for two more questions and then wrap up. This lady here and this gentleman there. Thank you, um, Elliot Riera from the Principle of Responsible Investment uh, based in the UK, but an international organization. Um, it's really great to see all the work that's been done on disclosures, and I think the UK has been quite a leader in this recently, but also really important is government policy and action to give certainty to investors. This year's events have shown how fragile the shift towards responsible investment can be. What would be your recommendation to the UK government in terms of actively shifting the default towards responsible investment and not just being a, a good av, a good to have for active responsible investors? Like to <laughs> oh, look at you, hot potato or what? <laughs> I nominate you, James. Uh, so I think the question was, uh, how do you get uh, d the dialogue with investors and you how do you uh, bring in t to all of that. Well, I think you know disclosure is obviously an important part of it uh, because uh, you know what you disclose has to be backed up by uh, what you've done and the accuracy around it. And that's you know what our lawyers get very very nervous about. You know we're making uh, disclosures out there. It's really quite hard to verify. Um, so that I think is really important. And again, I think we've got to almost uh, take the view. You know, progress is more important than perfection here, uh, and that we, as you know, the producers of the uh, of the transition plans, need to be mindful of that. But also, the users of transition plans need to be mindful of it as well. I think we'll skip straight to this gentleman starting to wind up. And if it helps, I'll just make an observation rather than ask a question because I know you can't all hear it. My observation builds on this gentleman's question about insurance. Um, of course, the transition plan task force was co-chaired by an insurance company, Aviva. Speaking for Aviva, the reason why we were so concerned is our business model is existentially exposed to physical risk. And of course, the data helps inform our actuarial projections. Most actuarial science is based on history rather than projections. This starts to enable us to look ahead. Now, looking ahead, insurers also lend enormous amounts of money to sovereign. To sovereign. Now, stewardship, which is normally investor company, needs to become investor to country. Macro stewardship. That's, I think, what the transition plan task force enables us to do, because we can then see what policy individual sectors need in order to be on the transition. So this, this is incredibly exciting. Okay, it was an observation, not a question, but I saw lots of you nodding your heads. So last question from me. James, you talked about progress, not perfection. Can I ask each of you to finish up giving us your worries about whether progress is not necessarily in the bag? Is there anything that could honor it and they have to honor it with a transition plan? I'd turn it around a little bit and say that one of the great enablers of progress is the work that GFANS do and the TPT Secretariat. And we wouldn't be where we are now without the work of uh, you know, these organizations that have come up in the last year, and that is extraordinary. So progress would be taking away that resource and, uh, and, and not being able to lean on it and use it to do this really excellent work. 
So I just I just build on Steve's point. I mean, them in the private sector is phenomenal and but the the policy question is the one that uh, happens and in many parts uh, the policy is not where it needs to be for in our transition plan. A better quarter of it is spent on our external engagement and what we're planning to do to lobby for the changes we need to see in the policy frameworks. So I think bringing the policy piece is we need to see in the policy frameworks. So I think bringing the policy piece into the transition plans will be increasingly important. Thank you. Uh, I, th I think it is unstoppable. I mean, many of us in this room are doing more, right, just pushing this. We are, it's faster than ever before. I think the thing that's going to slow us down, if anything, on top of regulation is skills. So we all need to be pushing everyone to train, upskill, learn, ask the questions now, start raising that baseline, getting people just enough information, as I say, to be dangerous and enter and join us in this race to the top. Thank you very much. Uh, to be honest, I think we have seen with the way that the Transition Plan Task Force has operated that we can bring every, every corner of uh, <laughs> the... the the, the, the market together and collaborate to deliver something really quite powerful. So we've had all stakeholder groups represented on this, uh, on, on, on this task force. We've had government, we've had regulators, we've had financial services sector, we've had real economy, civil society, academics, all coming together to deliver something uh, that we can now go away, road test and make sure that it's fit for purpose and I'm really, really uh, I I incredibly optimistic as to where this can take us. Everyone, everyone ha put their hands together for our panelists. <laughs> Battling the microphone. <laughs>